Good afternoon. Herman and I are going to tag team you in this presentation. There's a lot more billets being planted on more farms. So this talks to me a little bit about where we are in this transition from whole stock to billet planting in the industry. Let's start with the, the basics. This is the bottom line. Life is hard, sometimes really hard, for planted cane in Louisiana. So we put it in the ground, we expect it to establish and take off, but then here comes a long spell of dry weather, heavy rains, multiple frosts, a few freezes. If those aren't bad enough, you got stalk rots that can kick into gear and they're made worse when the stress conditions occur, the worst diseases of red rot. So what's been the solution? Well, traditionally what we've done is plant whole stalks and a lot of them. So even if you take a lot of damage in a bad year, you'd have enough to get an adequate stand the next spring and get your plant cane going. But a lot of factors are pushing us away from whole stalk planting. So billets, here we come. Let's think about the basics in terms of what is it that we're planting. Just back up a little bit. So here's the basic unit, I would call it, one joint. So what is that? You got two nodes. There's a bud or an eye at each node. There's little spots where the root primordy, where the first roots are going to be produced, called set roots. They bring the water and nutrients to that develop and shoot. There's a growth ring, we call it, that if this cane lodges, help it come back up again. But in the middle there, what you got, you got an inner node, and it's surrounded by a hard rind. And inside of that, you got the plumbing of the system and the, all the cells containing the sugar. So if you think about a whole stalk, what do you got? You got 10 or more joints. Very different situation when you go to a billet, though. You only got maybe three, mostly two. Why is there sugar in there? Well, the real purpose is for that plant to feed the developing shoot. The shoots, uh, set roots start to grow and the shoot starts to take off. So the energy in that inner node powers the first growth of that shoot. It's going to start to tiller, make its own roots, and off it goes. What's in that inner node? Well. The plumbing consists of long vessels that are carrying water up from the roots and nutrients and food back down from the top. So the lower right there is what you see is a cross section. They're gathered into what we call vascular bundles. So those look like those two big eyes looking at you. Those are big water conducting vessels where the water and nutrients are coming up from the roots. Uh, cells gathered above that are what's called the phloem. Those are cells or vessels bringing the food down from the leaves to feed the rest of the plant. So they're gathered together in these bundles, and you see in those where those red spots are, that's a cross section of a whole inner node, and it's stained, and it's fluorescent staining, so you can see those big vessels kind of looking back at you. So you see there are all these little vascular bundles scattered throughout that, that inner node, and in between are all the cells containing the sugar. Well, the plant's got an idea about what it wants to do with that sugar. Well, is anybody else interested in the sugar? Yeah, we are. Humans are after that sugar, so the farmers trying to grow it and get the sugar for the consumer. Insects may go after it, but let's focus on the microorganisms. Well, you know with harvested cane, the billets, you cut them, if it's warm and they sit too long, these bacteria, leuconostoc, start developing in there and they, they convert the, they make that dextran that interferes with sugar crystallization. But in the planted stalk, there's some fungi down there that can cause, to get in there and go after that sugar and cause a rotting of the stalk, and red rot is the worst one. So here's something I showed, a, a slide I started off with at a presentation in uh, St. Martin Parish. Red rot is coming for your billets. And there you see one of the billets is a typical three-node uh, billet. This one we inoculated. We got a, a test going in the greenhouse at a student project. And what we could see is uh, there's a spot there in the, on the one side, like a bore wound. We got drilled a hole and put spores in there. The red rot started. It spread across the nose and, and rotted the other one as well. <coughs> So here's what can happen, but how about this? Red rot is coming for your billets if it's given the chance. Are there solutions? Two possibilities. You can avoid the problem or you can control it directly, and that would be a chemical control. So what are we talking about with avoidance? Well, you can't do anything about the two cut ends, and these things are wound invaders, but you can do something about the other damage, the wounding damage that occurs to that the inner node rinds that on the stalk or the billets. So we figured out how to do a better job cutting longer lo uh, billets with less physical damage. Now the harvesters made some improvements and we're focused on the planter, not beat them up anymore going into the ground. 
Can you prevent environmental stress? The worst thing that can happen after billets are planted is a long dry spell. It really kicks the red rod into gear. So the best thing you can do is give adequate moisture when they're planted. Overall, it's all about good planting practices, just giving it good growth and let it, let it take off and not allow the, the rot to be a problem. Direct control, we're talking about seed treatment chemicals, and we've seen consistent benefits with a combination of a fungicide with this insecticide, platinum. And that's, you know, looked pretty promising. However, uh, now it looks like there's not gonna be a platinum label till probably 2024. Uh, all the work's done, it's sitting on the desk at EPA waiting for approval, but it's tied up in this litigation and review of these neonicotinoid, neonicotinoid insecticides. So I think it'll come through eventually. There's no reason it shouldn't, the, the work's all done. Uh, there's no reason, you know, it's going in the ground. There's no flowers or no bees uh, for the bee colony collapse pro problem. So it should come through eventually, but in the meantime, I think we just have to back off on this component of uh, this direct control of the stalk rots. Fungicide alone can help. We've got several labeled. You can see here uh, in this greenhouse test, you see the rotted billet, and now next to it's one that was treated with the Quilt XL and we put the spores in there. It's hard to stop all that rot, so this is not the answer totally, but you can slow it down. As you can see, it didn't spread across the node into the next inner node, and the nodes are staying sound. So where that shoots and the roots are developing, if we can protect the integrity of those, I think that's part of where the help's coming from. So there's a lot of little things. The chemical control is not the answer. A lot of it's tied with the stress factors, and so here's the checklist for success we've come up with. How many boxes can you check? As many as you can. If you can, then the, the, you've got, that's your highest uh, chance of success, is uh, more boxes you can check. And if you can, we've seen the billets come through and do well, even with very stressful environmental conditions occurring after planting. Every year is different. Um, we've seen them do well in these varied conditions. Uh, it's all related to stress, but this season we've got Another storyline that we haven't really looked at and hadn't seen yet, and uh, that would be where, particularly down the Bayou Lafourche area, where planting was running late, and then the storm hit, and the hurricane comes in, so a lot of people had to plant billets after harvest had started. So that meant, you know, you can't, there's only so much you can do adjusting the machine you're cutting your crop with, and shorter billets, some treatments, some, you know, conditions are variable, so Herman and Atticus and, and uh, Wilson, recognizing this, went out and did a survey. So they looked carefully on multiple farms at what were people doing, what kind of planters and harvesters, and got a lot of good information on that. So the survey results won't be known until this spring, but there's, he, Herman's gonna give you all the information about where, what, were, what they did. Thank you, Jeff. So that's one of the good things about uh, our jobs is we, uh, when we do get the chance, we get to uh, get out on the farms and see what growers are doing. And uh, and this past year, uh, as Jeff was talking about, um, you know, we, there was more billet planting that was been done. Over the last several years, uh, a lot of more growers have been uh, getting a little bit more comfortable with billets. And um, this past year, Ida provided a, a unique uh, uh, opportunity for some even more people to get involved in billets even though they didn't they didn't really uh, plan to uh, before the storm of course uh, there's always been the labor issue uh, a lot of growers are interested in reducing their amount of labor uh, because of the planning delays and the short window of opportunity um, we have uh, a lot of growers and, and machinery manufacturers have been improving on the harvesters uh, investing in uh, mechanical planters and um, so we've made a lot of improvements over the years uh, as Jeff's talked about there's more seed cane treatments um, available and so there's a lot more confidence in billet planting um, Wilson Atticus and I we took the opportunity to do this survey and uh, we were able to survey seven forms uh, from October 11th to the 19th of last year, and we were able to observe the harvesters and the planters. Uh, all the billets that were being planted was L01299. Um, we measured pre-plant and planted billet quality. We were able to do pre-plant billet quality at four places, and, uh, and of course, the, the planted billet quality at all seven. 
So I'll try to break those out for you. We measured our billet length, the number of buds, the amount of the total amount of buds and the good buds, the amount of seed cane used, um, and some other other parameters that I'll. So uh, we also determined a fall and spring germination percentage. We went 60 days and 90 days. I'll share with you the 90 day uh, shoot counts. Um, so just a little bit of information on the harvesters being used. They were all either John Deere uh, 570s or 3520s. Uh, they on form number A, uh, it was modified to do an eight foot um, as an eight foot machine. And the planter being used there was a one row slat type planter. Um, we looked at three row slat type planters, three of those, and three uh, single row just whole stalk drum planters also. So it's a good cross section. Some of these, uh, of course, the people that had invested in slat planters, they had planted billets before. So there is a learning curve. Um, you know, the first time you plant billets, uh, you may do something a little bit different the second or third year you do it uh, compared to the first year. But uh, so most of these one row drum planters were uh, first time uh, billet uh, planting for these growers. Just some pictures. You can see the, uh, the one row slat type planter, a Louisiana made. Uh, the three row slat type planters were also Louisiana made. Uh, just a single row drum planter. Uh, we've all seen these. And then the Australian type three row slat type planter, we'd, uh, we were able to look at one of those. Um, something that we is missing in this, we looked at equipment only. We really didn't look at um, uh, the, the seed cane treatments that were being applied. But all the uh, places were putting out some type of seed cane um, protection uh, whether it was on the machines, the, the planters, or on the covers. We had one place where they, they were actually just spraying with a, a field sprayer then come back and covering. But uh, they, were all, they were all spraying, um, and we made no attempt to know what they were spraying. For all we know, it was water. Um, so um, the harvesters, you can see the harvesters listed again. We looked at the fan speed. We interviewed, interviewed the, the operators and the growers, and we looked at, uh, we varied from 650 RPMs to on up to 950 RPMs. Some growers felt like they needed to clean billets more. Others said, uh, well, I just, I don't want to uh, run my fans too much not to do any damage. All of them had uh, solid floors. No, excuse me. Four of them had solid floors. Of course, that's one of the things, uh, talking to some, some of the growers, that's one of the first things they would look at, you know, some of the expanded metal on, that so on the regular combine uh, versus the solid floor. They feel like they, they get more damage to billets if they don't have the solid floors. But as you kind of imagine, the, the three growers who were uh, not planning to plant uh, billets before Ida uh, did not have solid floors and elevators. Every other slat is removed, that's common. Uh, base cutter protection. I'll show you a picture of this. Uh, uh, only one grower did not have any base cutter protection. Uh, one blade chopper on top and bottom, um, that was on all of them. And then some of them had the, uh, the rubber inserts. I don't know if you remember some years back when we were trying to uh, cut a, a longer billet, they replaced that, um, the, uh, when they took the blades out, they put the rubber insert to try to do less damage, and uh, I got a picture of that. Oh, and um, let's see, we had three, three growers that did not uh, have, uh, that had uh, the, um, the rubber inserts and the other ones did not. So this is the, uh, the, the protection, the kicker type uh, protection on the, on the leg of the uh, base cutter, and then the solid floor, of course, and then, and then on, the, um, on the chopper drum, you can see the, uh, the rubber inserts that was sometimes used. Um, so looking at pre-plant um, billet quality, in other words, coming right out of the billet, uh, out, of, out of the harvester, we looked at uh, bud damage, uh, in and node and end damage, and uh, all places we looked at um, uh, at least 50 billets more or more. Um, and uh, you can see a picture of Attica. Sometimes we had to climb on top the, uh, the, uh, the transfer wagon. 
except the uh, the other places where um, the uh, the whole stock planter would would go directly to it. We had to get it right out of the uh, harvester. But um, but anyway, um, looking at some of the information, I can set this up for you. Uh, on the four uh, places that we did um, the form C, D, F, and G, we uh, did pre-plant cane quality. We measured the uh, the billets, and you can see some uh, two two of them were cutting 15-inch billets, and two of them were cutting a little bit longer billets, 125 and one at 22-inch billets. Um, the number of buds, uh, this is the number of uh, total buds, um, range from 2.5 on up to four buds per billet. Of course, the longer billets had, had more buds. And we did, to figure out bud damage, inner node damage, and end damage, what we did was we looked at the total number of buds, and we went and inspected every billet and looked at the ones that had damage and the ones that were good, and we, we we recorded that. The total number of nodes that were uh, um, on, on the, the billets, the ones that were damaged and the ones that were not, and then the same thing for ends. And you can see on the last, and, and that ranged from all the way from 3% damage to, to, uh, to the bottom, 9% uh, on the inner in nodes and 9% and, uh, and on, uh, on the end damage. So that varied. but one, the last column on, on, the, on the right is kind of a, a nice column. We looked at, out of all the billets that we looked at per form, we looked at the percentage of billets that had no damage at all. So that's why these, these damage, they don't add up to, uh, you know, 63%. But 63% um, of the damage, of, of, no, of, of the billets with no damage, 74%, 72%. And 56 percent. So, uh, on all cases, from half to three quarters of the billets that the growers were planting had no damage at all. Whether it, no bud damage, no end and no damage, and no end damage. So I think that's a, a nice, um, a nice thing for us to shoot for. Um, I think uh, we we don't necessarily we, we might look at a couple of billets and say, okay, it looks good. I think we will go with that. I think look at the detail. Um, look at uh, the settings on your combine and, and try to get the, the most uh, of, of your billets. And all of our growers that we surveyed looked like the majority of what they were planting had no damage at all. We also looked at uh, the planter effect on the billet quality and um, looked again at billet length, bud damage, inner node, and end damage, and then for here, we looked at 30 to 50 billets at all seven locations. And um, we, um, Atticus and Wilson can tell you, um, you know, every grower said, look, you can come look, but don't get in my way. Uh, you know, uh, so we had to work fast. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, we tried to get as good amount of data as possible. Looking, we measured the, the total amount of, uh, of billets in a given area. We weighed the billets, so we got an average billet um, weight and we counted the number of billets at several uh, different locations in the field so we could get um, the total tons of seed cane used. That, I'm going to show you that information later. But um, that's also besides the billet length and, and the uh, damage. Uh, so looking at planted cane quality, and you can see again, um, the shortest billets being planted was in the 15 and 17 uh, inch billets. These tended to be in the three-row slat type planters. Um, the uh, the whole stalk planters tended to plant longer type billets. They could handle longer type billets. And of course, they had more total buds per billet in, in the longer billets. That's just common sense. Um, and look at the damage, uh, the bud damage, in and no damage, and end damage again. Some, some uh, Billets were had a little bit more than others, but in the and again in the end we're looking at from um, we had one planter down in the bottom that had only 33 percent of the of what they were putting out had no damage at all, but everybody else was looking at right right at half 
to three quarters of what they, of the billets that they were planning had no damage at all. So um, I think this is, this is an important statistic. Uh, I would like to look at some more of this, maybe even look at more billets if we get t time next year or in the coming years and um, look at some of the settings on the combines and work with some of the growers and see, uh, you know, how we can um, even improve on this even more. So looking at the four um, forms where we did both pre and post to see if the planter was doing any more damage than the, than the harvester or was the harvester doing most of the damage. And, um, you know, you can look at those middle columns again, and I don't see a whole lot of difference in any of those. Um, in some of those, you say, well, gosh, um, in, in foreign number C, you had more 15% uh, uh, pre-plant damage and only had 13% uh, planted damage. How did, how did that uh, happen? Well, keep in mind, this was after the storm, and uh, they were actually planting along, a, uh, they were cutting seed along a tree line right here. And um, we actually took a picture, I don't know if I have it in here, but they actually had tree limbs uh, uh, being uh, cut uh, because uh, farmers really had to go through a lot this year to plant that cane crop. But in the end, um, if you look at that final column on the right, you can see 63% were pre-plant, 63% after, that, that's what was in the row again. So really no damage uh, that I could see from the planter in that case. Uh, 40, uh, 74 versus 64, uh, not that much difference. 72 versus 72. And then only really the last, the one in, uh, in form G, this was the, the uh, form that had no real protection and uh, they looked like they were doing a lot more damage with their planters uh, than they did with the, uh, with the harvester in this case. But uh, I think 33% is, is a pretty low, low number of billets that uh, with no damage at all. And I'm gonna show you why I'm, I'm showing what happens. We went back and like I told you, we, we weighed each billet, we got an average billet weight, we counted the number of billets in a given area, and we were able to calculate the tons of seed cane used per acre. Now, you know, normally when you talk to a grower, he's talking about four to one, five to one, three to one, whatever, he gives, gives you his ratio. He, this, this tons of cane per acre probably doesn't mean anything to you all, but this is the really the only way we could figure out um, how many good buds he was putting out, how many tons of seed cane. Uh, we're looking at right around eight, eight to 12 tons of seed cane being used. Um, and uh, we put in a lot of billets, uh, a lot of good buds out there. In all cases, 140 to uh, almost 200 uh, good buds per acre. Um, and the shoots per acre 90 days after planting, and we could figure a germination percentage. Some of these places at 46,000 uh, good shoots per uh, that that are um, that are germinated. Um, that's we had no gaps there. Uh, even at 21,000 uh, shoots, we had really no gaps. There's a little light on the row. Uh, if you remember right, we had uh, six, uh, six or eight weeks of dry weather. And I think maybe that had some, some effect on this. But germination in that 20 to 35%, um, even at 11%, uh, that's a lot of had to do with the dry weather, I think. But uh, the one, place that had 30, only 33% of the billets that were put out with no damage, we were not able to detect any, any stand of cane on the roll yet. So uh, hopefully it comes out in the spring and they don't have a stand failure, but I think this is where we, we really need to look at damage to billets, even though we have seed cane protection, is that when you have adverse germination um, weather, uh, after you plant that billet, it stays dry or it, it, or it, or it stays wet or whatever. Um, I think that's where uh, it really matters, the, the quality of billet that you put out. I'm almost done, Al. Um, the, so uh, as a summary, uh, we're looking at, we looked at harvester and planter adjustments, can improve billet seed cane quality, 
pre-plant cane quality range from 56 to 74 percent billets with no damage. Three-row slant type planters generally use shorter billets than drum type planters. Um, planted billet quality range from 33% to 72%. We look like we're using 7.6 to 12.6 tons of seed cane per acre. And at 90 days, we range uh, from very few to 35.2%. 35 35 and, uh, you know, we can have successful billet planting operations. We proved that. Um, but careful attention to detail. I think detail, detail, detail. Just leave y'all with a little bit of, uh, that might be a little familiar to some of y'all, huh? Thank y'all. <laughs>